This video is from our archives. We interviewed two leading AMD architects and CPU designers at the initial Ryzen press event. That video disappeared under a pile of other work that we had to produce, and we only just resurfaced the content. The video walks through some key architectural elements of the Ryzen CPUs and Zen architecture. So we'll let the two guests take it away and describe UOP cache and other aspects of Ryzen. Enjoy this revisit to our archived content. Uh, we're with Sam and Mike, who Mike is the chief architect. Sam is a corporate fellow at AMD, and hopefully, we can get some more depth on Ryzen, the architecture, and uh, how some of the lower level stuff works. So the, I, I suppose the first question that I had, if you haven't read the article or seen the core video, check that out first, because I'll give you a primer. But in that content, we'll talk about something called micro-op cache. And this is one of the newer things that David Cantor spoke about in his microprocessor report. You've spoken about it on stage to us. So could you provide a, a top level overview? What is this? And then maybe go into more depth. Sure. Yeah. Uh, one of the hardest problems in trying to build a high frequency x86 processor is that the instructions are actually a variable length. And so that means to, find, to try to get a, a lot of them to dispatch in a wide form, it's a serial process. So to do that, generally, we've had to build deep pipelines, very power hungry to do that. So what the, uh, we actually call it an op cache because it actually stores them in a more dense format than in the past. But what it does is we, having seen them once, and we store them in this op cache with, with those boundaries removed. So when you find the first one, you find all its neighbors with it. And so that we can actually put them in that cache eight at a time. So we can pull eight out per cycle and we can actually cut two stages off that pipeline of trying to figure out the instructions. So it gives us that double whammy of a power savings and a huge performance uplift. So on the, on the power savings side, is there anything you could add about specific uh, power saving steps you've taken with Ryzen? Okay. <laughs> could be <laughs> here a, a long few, right? time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, Mike, Mike mentioned the opcache, and that's one example of microarchitecture and power reductions working in to get, I mean, hand in hand, right? I mean, and the thing he didn't mention is that x86 decode, the variable length instructions are very complex, requires a ton of logic. I mean, guys make their career doing this sort of thing. And, and so you, you pump all these x86 instructions in there, burns a lot of power to decode them all. And in our prior designs, then every time you encounter that code loop, you got to go do it again, right? And you got this expensive logic block chunking away. Now we just stuff those micro ops into the op cache, all the decoding done, and the hit rate there is what? It's yeah, really high. It can be up to 90% on a lot yeah. of workloads. So. so that means we're <laughs> only doing that heavyweight decode 10% of the time. So it's a big power saver, which is great. The other thing we, we did, you know, one example that was on your slides is the right back L1 cache. So we aren't consistently pushing the data through to the L2. There are some simplifications if you do that, but we added the complexity of a right back. So now we keep stuff way more local, right? So we're not moving data around because that wastes power. And I can keep going. You know, <laughs> one, one of the things that, um, that I highlighted earlier today that I think is really cool is the effort the team put in to squeeze down the overhead power. So in a CPU core, I mean, these things running over four gigahertz, it's very hard to get the clocks out to all those billions of transistors with picosecond accuracy. It takes a lot of wires, a lot of big drivers to do that in the silicon. We invest a ton of engineering to optimize that down and cut 40% out of that clock network. And we had worked really hard cutting power out in prior generations, but we got 40% more this time. And we also op optimized the sequential elements that move the data in between the logic. They're kind of like the glue that holds the logic together. We optimized the crap out of those things, made them really small and power efficient. And the net net is that, you know, when you look at the power breakdown for the core, there's, you know, most processors, you got clock power, you have sequential power, and then you have a little bit that's the logic gates, right? The thing's doing actual right. work. And what we did on this core is we grew that logic gate percentage by 35%, right? So now it's bigger than the other two overhead pieces. So those are a couple of the things, efficient microarchitecture, allocating more power to useful work, and a bunch of other things that got all that IPC enhancement, right? So we talked 52% plus IPC. A rule of thumb with 
experienced processor architects is that you pretty much pay 1% power for 1% IPC. If you work really hard at it, it's easier to do a lot worse than that. But if you give you, you know, you push your designers, you're gonna you're gonna grow power as you push more instructions through the pipe. Makes sense, right? You're doing more work, you're switching more right. gates, eating more instructions, running that decoder. Um, burns power. Uh, <clears throat> but what we did here, we burned no additional power for all that increased IPC. That's that's a hell of an accomplishment. And one thing, you going back to what you were talking about with cache, L1 cache, I think, uh, you're talking about write back versus write through, which as from reading, again, Cantor's report, that was one of the major changes with Ryzen, it sounds like. Could you go into more detail about what the uh, what sort of the specific meaning is of right back versus right through? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, mine, mine <laughs> well, so so on the right through cache, your writes would both go into the L1, and then they would be propagated again into a structure to go into the L2. And so with the right back cache, the right the the writes go into the L1 cache, and they don't go into the L2 in the states maintained in the L1. They may transfer to the L2 once they're evicted from the cache, but they're not kept updated in both places. Okay, so more back to everything else, efficiency and power savings right. and things Keeping, like that. Uh, not moving the data until you absolutely have to. You, you want to talk about the shadow tags too? That's another oh, cool yeah. little <clears throat> widget we put in there. Yeah, the shadow tags was a nice optimization. We have a, a victim cache for our L3, and so when a core misses in its L2, it might miss in the L3, but it might be in another uh, L2 cache local in the core. So typically we would just probe all those to find it, uh, that causes some performance problems with bandwidth in the L2 and, and burns a lot of power. So instead, we built these shadow tags within the L3 macro, and that lets us quickly know which one of the cores the data is in and go get it. And we also did it in a unique way, a two-stage mechanism, so that we can, with a partial lookup, we can know whether we're going to hit or not and only fire the second stage if we hit on the first stage. And that lets us save about 75% of power than an equivalent implementation where we wouldn't have probed everyone. So it's pretty amazing. Right. I've got uh, one more sort of higher, high level question to start with, and we'll see, see where it goes. Uh, so, talking about stages in a pipeline has come up a few times here already. <laughs> right. uh, as I understand it, Ryzen is, is it accurate to say somewhere around 19, 20 stages in the integer pipe? Or? Uh, we haven't really released that, but it is shorter than our previous generation. So we can say that. <laughs> okay. So and yes, pipeline, every pipeline stage, you know, is more power for getting the same amount of work done. Now we typically do that to reach a higher frequency, but if you can hit the same frequency with less pipeline stages, you've won. And uh, to give perspective, what sort of uh, checks or what is happening within each stage generally as a concept? Well, I mean, the instructions go through a process of fetch. You know, we break the pipeline down into we have the branch predictor, we have fetch, we have decode, we have execute, and then we have, um, and that's bo there's both a floating point and integer execute, and load store kind of works in there, all the execution units, and then a retire stage. So we break those, func those, they're, those are functional blocks within the chip, and they're all pipelined, and they kind of feed, the, the whole pipeline feeds that way. And uh, pipeline stages have a uh, direct correlation with frequency or? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the amount of work, you know, your frequency is set by how much work you can th get done per cycle, you know, and meet the frequency target. And so, yeah, you try to get, as, you try to balance each stage of the pipeline to the same amount of work so you can get the highest frequency. If one pipeline stage tries to do too much work, it'll set the frequency for the whole chip and you'll kind of be on un unbalanced design. So we work very hard to make sure each pipeline stage is properly balanced throughout the design. That's why it's Zen. It's well balanced. <laughs> That's why, yes. Very cool. So for more information on Zen, Ryzen, and the CPUs as we review them, links in the description below as always. Thank you for joining me, Sam. My pleasure. And Mike. It's nice to meet you. And yep. we'll see you all next time.